We're at the Texas State Capitol in Austin, Texas, in front of the monument to the 8th Texas Cavalry, known as Terry's Texas Rangers, to announce Episode 3 of the Texas Generals, presented by the Texas Division of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. I'm Johnny Anderson, Chief Research Officer of the Civil War Project and member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. This episode will profile the life and career of Major General John Austin Wharton, who commanded Terry's Rangers for much of the war between the states. General Wharton was killed at the end of the war, but probably not how you think. Stay tuned and watch the episode to find out how. And as always, if you like the video, give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. The story of John Austin Wharton begins in Nashville, Tennessee, where he was born on the 3rd of July, 1828, while his father and mother were there on a shopping trip to buy furniture for their Texas plantation. He was the only son of William H. Wharton and Sarah Ann Gross. Both his father and his uncle, John Austin Wharton, whom he was named after, were prominent figures in the Texas Revolution. John spent his early childhood at the family's plantation called Eagle Island that his grandfather had built along Oyster Creek, 12 miles from the mouth of the Brazos River. The plantation had eight or nine rooms and entertained many a weary traveler and prominent Texan. When John was eight, he was sent to live with his uncle, Leonard Gross, Sarah's brother, at the Bernardo Plantation near present-day Hempstead, Texas. There he was under the tutelage of a Bostonian named Dean, who'd been recommended as a brilliant teacher. Mr. Dean later founded a college in Galveston that John also attended until the age of 15. He was sent to Columbia, South Carolina to attend South Carolina College, which would later become the University of South Carolina. At South Carolina, John studied law under one of the preeminent lawyers of South Carolina, William C. Preston. It was in Mr. Preston's home that he met his future wife, Penelope Johnson, the daughter of the governor of South Carolina. John graduated in 1849, and he and Penelope were married a few days later and left for Texas. John and Penelope had two daughters, Sarah Ann, who died while still a baby, and Kate Ross, who died when she was 18. John practiced law with Clinton Terry in Brazoria until 1861. He was elected district attorney in 1859 and a delegate to the Secession Convention in January of 1861. It was John Wharton who made the motion at the convention that Texas secede from the Union. The motion passed 166 to 8, with Wharton voting to leave the Union. When the war broke out, Frank Terry raised his famous cavalry regiment, the 8th Texas Cavalry, known as the Terry's Texas Rangers. Wharton joined with the company in September of 1861 and became captain of Company B. Terry's Rangers were unique in that every man that enlisted had to provide a shotgun, a 24-inch Bowie knife, a revolver, and a saddle. No standard uniforms were provided, so the men wore whatever they could find. When Terry was killed in Woodsonville, Kentucky in December of 1861, Wharton was elected as colonel to command the regiment, after Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Lubbock, who was next in line for command, died of disease. Following the fall of Fort Donaldson, the regiment fell back with the rest of Albert Sidney Johnston's army from Nashville to Corinth, Mississippi. On the first day of the Battle of Shiloh, the Rangers were in position on the left flank of Leonidas Polk's First Corps. As the battle raged on April 6, 1862, Wharton and the 8th Texas Cavalry succeeded in turning Sherman's right flank. Wharton was shot in the leg but remained in command. In addition to the other losses on the 6th, Clint Terry, Wharton's law partner, was killed in action. On the 7th of April, after the Federals attacked with Don Carlos Buell's reinforcements that had reached Pittsburgh Landing overnight, the Rangers were forced to fall back. At the end of the day, Wharton was moved back to Corinth, Mississippi to have his wound attended to, leaving Thomas Harrison in command. Union General William T. Sherman called the Rangers the most dangerous set of men which the war turned loose upon the world. Wharton was wounded again during the First Battle of Murfreesboro in July of 1862 
and hadn't fully recovered when he rejoined the regiment for the invasion of Kentucky with Braxton Bragg. Wharton's brilliant charge at Bargetown, Kentucky, where he defeated the Federals with a greatly outnumbered force, won him a promotion to Brigadier General. Braxton Bragg and Nathan Bedford Forrest disliked each other immensely. So in September of 1862, Bragg reorganized, assigning Forrest to raise another command of partisans and placed Wharton in charge of the reorganized brigade. Wharton's brigade went on to fight at the Second Battle of Murfreesboro, also known as Stones River. In March of 1863, Wharton was given command of a division in Wheeler's new cavalry corps and went on to fight the battles of Chattanooga and Chickamauga, which earned him a promotion to Major General. In 1864, Wharton was assigned to the Trans-Mississippi Department in Louisiana, leading the cavalry under Lieutenant General Richard Taylor. Arriving at the Battle of Pleasant Hill just after Taylor had routed Banks' the army, Wharton's cavalry pursuit of Banks down the Red River earned him high praise from Taylor. By 1865, Wharton was part of Major General John Bankhead Magruder's crumbling Trans-Mississippi Department. When Magruder reorganized the department, he placed George W. Baylor's regiment under Wharton's command. Baylor was also a Texan and had fought at Shiloh as Albert Sidney Johnston's aide-de-camp and had commanded a cavalry regiment at the battles of Mansfield and Pleasant Hill. Wharton had a reputation of taking care of his friends and family first, and Baylor was neither, so when dismounted troops were needed to form an infantry division, Wharton assigned Baylor's dismounted troops to 66-year-old Colonel Nathaniel Terry. Colonel Terry had been a political appointment and had no combat experience and was technically inferior in rank to Baylor. As you would expect, Baylor was none too happy. He took it as a personal insult and wanted his command assigned anywhere but Terry. While both Baylor and Wharton were in Houston on April 6, 1865, Baylor continued to seethe. He tried to enlist the help of Brigadier General Walter P. Lane at the railroad depot, but he refused to get involved. As Baylor and Captain R.H.E. Sorrell walked through town, they spied Wharton and Brigadier General James Harrison riding in a buggy, having just come from his headquarters near Hempstead. Voices were raised, with Wharton calling Baylor a damned liar and Baylor calling Wharton a liar and a demagogue. Before Baylor could strike Wharton, Harrison urged the horse and buggy forward to avoid a fight. Baylor, seeking redress, went to the Fannin House Hotel, which was the headquarters for General Magruder. Magruder was not in the hotel, so Baylor went to his private room to wait for him. After stewing over the morning, Wharton and Harrison went to the Fannin House to also see Magruder and to settle things. There they found Baylor in Magruder's room. Voices were raised again. Wharton, who was unarmed, struck Baylor in the face with a clenched fist. Baylor drew his Navy revolver and shot Wharton through the heart, killing him instantly. Wharton's body was transported to Austin for burial with full military honors. General Magruder himself led the procession to the train station. John Austin Wharton is buried in the Texas State Cemetery, not far from Albert Sidney Johnston and Adam Rankin Johnson. His wife Penelope and daughters are buried in the family plot where the Eagle Island Plantation once stood. <laughs>